everyone. Uh, greetings. Welcome to the Shorenstein Center and welcome to uh, Harvard uh, University's Kennedy School of Government, where this forum is virtually taking place. And uh, I'm Charlie Sennett. I'm, I'm the founder of the Ground Truth Project, which is based uh, also in, in, uh, in the Boston, Cambridge area at WGBH, uh, public radio and television in Boston. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ground Truth, but most importantly, we are here to, to hear from my colleague and, and, and someone whose work I greatly admire, Samiola Mahdi. Samiola um, was very recently the bureau chief for Radio Free Europe in Kabul. Um, before that, he was also founding and working uh, very hard on PAIC Investigative Center, which is a which is a investigative journalism center in Kabul that does outstanding investigative work uh, in really important voice in Afghanistan. And Sammy has written a research paper, which he's going to share the findings of that with us. And um, hoping all of you have seen it and had access to it, and we'll have some good questions for him. But welcome, Sammy. So great to have you. Thank you so much, Charles. You are always very generous in uh, giving me introductions. So it's happy to, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's easy because your work is outstanding. And um, we're going to have a lot of questions for you, Samuel. I'm going to ask the first few. Um, and Samuel is joining us uh, from Ankara uh, and is experiencing pretty good internet right now. We're going to hope it just holds. If, if Sammy's video disappears, it's because uh, it's better to get internet connection sometimes without the video and just go to audio. So we'll hope to keep you here with us, but if we have to switch to that, that just letting everyone know that's the case. Um, I wanted to start off framing a little bit. I was just in Afghanistan um, in the end of July. I was there on a trip, which was really a full circle moment for me as a journalist. Um, I've been covering uh, Afghanistan since 1993, since the first World Trade Center bombing um, and began a journey there Really, really doing local reporting, police reporting in New York City. Um, and again, this was the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. So eight years before 9-11. And a city editor at the Daily News asked a really good question. Um, he said, you have to go find out why someone would want to blow up the World Trade Center. Um, and it, it sent me on a journey for the New York Daily News where I was working at the time covering police, but soon I was doing a police story that led me to a lot of corners of the world, um, to Khartoum, where a tall gentleman from Saudi Arabia was living at the time named Osama bin Laden, to Pakistan, where one of the masterminds, turns out, uh, Ramzi Youssef was from Pakistan, and to Egypt and to other places, but in Egypt, especially following the trail of some of the members who would later go on to lead Al Qaeda, but also Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, who was part of that first plot in 1993. So this is a long trail that then led to me becoming the Boston Globe's Middle East Bureau Chief. And I was uh, the lead reporter in Afghanistan and in Iraq at different times with a team of reporters who all worked together. And really, an, it was um, an amazing commitment by the Boston Globe to cover the story. Remember, 9-11 really begins in some ways at Logan International Airport. And it was a story that the Globe took seriously. So 20 years of covering that conflict. Um, I was arrived in Afghanistan on September 19th, 2001. I think John Lee Anderson from The New Yorker and I were among the first reporters on the ground, Western reporters on the ground. Um, to cover 9-11. And um, it's been a long journey ever since, but returning 20 years later, many trips in between, I was struck by um, the fact that I did not see this chaotic, stressful, and rapid decline coming there on the ground. And I wasn't hearing it from the United States military, from the State Department, from Afghan government officials, and from people I knew. I stayed at an NGO that I know for 15, 16 years. I met with a principal who I've known for 15 or 16 years at a girls' school. I tried to really hit the landscape. And I would say it's important to note that it was hard to see this coming. Um, I was also spending a lot of time in newsrooms, which sort of brings me full circle to, to, uh, to the landscape of media in Afghanistan. And the reason the Ground Truth Project, my organization was in Afghanistan is because we support local journalism around the world. We try to support emerging journalists in undercovered corners of the world 
so that they can report on the stories that matter most to those local communities. We like to say that there's a deep crisis in local news. Right here in America, there's a deep crisis in local news. And we support 300 emerging journalists in 200 local newsrooms across America. We also support approximately, depends on the year, but about 30 to 40 reporting fellows and core members in our program, which we call Report for the World. So Ground Truth has two flagship programs, Report for America, across local newsrooms in America, and Report for the World, where we're mostly in Nigeria, India, and next week we're gonna be launching an expansion uh, into Brazil. And we are, um, we are really trying to do something that Madi's given a lot of thought to, which is how to get the landscape of news and find out where we can help and begins with understanding that landscape. So I was in Afghanistan in newsrooms, meeting with local reporters to try to get a sense of the investment that's been made in a free press in Afghanistan by the United States and by the international donors. Um, and it's substantial. It's one of the things that Afghanistan has accomplished. And Mahdi traces this uh, extremely well in his, in his research paper, which was done over the spring and summer leading up to the pullout. And then of course, to the stunning collapse we all witnessed um, in, the, in the end of August and into September. Um, so I want to I want to just sort of hasten to to welcome Mahdi more more officially and say that Sammy I want to I want to start off with a question where maybe you could just frame for us why you wanted to do this landscape analysis of the media in Afghanistan and what were your key findings. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Charles, and uh, great to be here again. Um, well. There was a sense that Taliban are coming back. It was uh, kind of uh, visible and uh, sensible that uh, everything around Afghanistan and the region is kind of, uh, you know, you know, orchestrating the uh, Taliban's come back to power. Uh, but uh, most people were, you know, prophesying and uh, foreseeing. Uh, maybe a joint government between the Taliban, a coalition government between the Taliban and uh, political elite in Kabul who were governing the uh, country for uh, uh, 20 years. <clears throat> then one of most uh, important questions for people uh, such as myself as a journalist was what will happen to the media and uh, uh, journalism in Afghanistan, free press in Afghanistan, which uh, has been, as you correctly mentioned, one of most important achievements of Afghanistan and international community uh, in the country. At the same time, we remember the history of uh, Taliban with uh, media, which has been a history uh, colored with blood. Uh, they have uh, the uh, blood of so many reporters and media workers uh, in their hand. So uh, during their uh, Brian, during, I mean, 1990s, uh, Taliban banned all uh, sorts of uh, media with the exception of the only radio channel in Afghanistan, which is the state radio. While comparing the uh, post 2001 with uh, the Taliban era, one can see a vibrant uh, media industry in the country and uh, a revolution of media industry in Afghanistan, which is not, I mean, uh, seeable in any of our neighboring countries. None of our neighboring countries had the same, the same level of uh, free speech and the uh, vibrant media that we uh, used to have in Afghanistan. So this question was very important for, for me what will happen to media and how we could try to, you know, uh, survive, how, how the international community, international NGOs and media industry in Afghanistan itself could, you know, um, 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 take some policies uh, which could help them and enable them to sustain media industry, even if Taliban are in power. Thanks. Um... Sammy, the title of your research paper, The Pen versus the AK-47, The Future of Afghan Media Under the Taliban, 
Um, I sadly think it feels like the AK-47 is winning in that competition. Um, and I want to I want to get into some of the key findings you pointed out in, in a really great framing at the top. It was a sense of inevitability that the Taliban was coming on strong. You could feel that when I was there on the ground. You could feel it in the provinces. You could certainly feel it coming toward the capital. And to be precise, what, what I guess I meant was the speed with which that inevitability happened, I think caught many of us off guard. I know it caught me off guard. Were you surprised uh, to see just how quickly the Afghan military collapsed, how quickly the government collapsed? Yes, uh, uh, everyone was uh, surprised because we saw how our, our military was fighting, our police forces were fighting against the Taliban fiercely in different provinces and districts. But all of a sudden, uh, districts start falling apart and Taliban started uh, taking over districts just like a storm, inevitable and uh, non-stoppable. And that was how Taliban were, uh, you know, framing it uh, on a PR level as well, that this collapse is inevitable and Taliban are unstoppable. And then it came to the provincial centers and uh, cities. And then all of a sudden we saw that Taliban are very close to Kabul. And there was a sense of helplessness inside Kabul during the last days that I was in Kabul, I got out, out of Kabul just the evening before Kabul collapsed. And the, a sense of lack of leadership on the uh, military uh, and police forces, uh, uh, national security forces, lack of leadership on the um, political level, uh, that was visible and uh, because we remember the collapse of Najib's regime after the withdrawal of the Soviet uh, troops uh, from Afghanistan in 1992. I mean, the collapse in 1992 took place. So it was a repeat of the history, kind of repeat of history, but much more uh, with, with much more uh, speed. And about the title of uh, my research, uh, AK. 47 versus pain or pen versus AK-47. I think, unfortunately, uh, this time it's not just AK-47, but also M4s, American M4s in the hands of the Taliban, which has uh, taken over Afghanistan. And uh, uh, the title comes from uh, a conversation that I had uh, last year with the Taliban uh, negotiators in Doha. One of my colleagues asked uh, one of Taliban negotiating leaders, uh, who is now the current uh, Taliban Minister of uh, Culture and, and Information, and he was a prisoner in Guantanamo. Uh, his name is Mullah uh, Khairullah uh, Khan. That, what is your definition of media, my colleague asked. He said, we are afraid of you. That's our defini definition of you. So that's how this research began. I loved that part. That's really the opening of your, of your report. I wanna find out some of the key findings of, of your research into how the media landscape um, really expanded and grew during the 20 years uh, the United States was in Afghanistan. And I wanna to get to that, but before I do, I think it's, it's important to hit a note that you hit um, about your own family and your own journey out of Afghanistan. And just, just something that I'm sure people watching are interested in. I, I was in touch with you through some of that journey and I could hear the distress in your voice and I could feel the sense of tremendous concern you and every Afghan and any of us who care about that country could feel and the sense of fear we all had um, for those uh, left behind, for the whole country of Afghanistan. But maybe share with us, um, how's your family? Um, how are you doing? And how, how is your family still in Afghanistan? And how do, you, how do you see this moment as an Afghan? Um, it's a total heartbreak uh, for us, for my family, for my friends, colleagues, 
people that I knew in, in Afghanistan and I grew up with them. Um, you know, most of uh, people that I knew, they were not willing to leave the country under any circumstances. They had the chance to, you know, get out of the country and uh, live abroad. Uh, but they refused and they were saying that we will continue working and struggling inside Afghanistan. We prefer to be here and do something for our country. Uh, my colleagues, most of journalists and reporters, they, they were, I mean, uh, these kind of people. They are this kind of people. I remember once uh, I was asked in a TV interview that, what's your nightmare? I said, my nightmare is that, uh, God forbid, in one day I will lose my country and I will become a refugee somewhere. So now we are living that ni nightmare. And it's not easy. It's it's very difficult. All of a sudden, you lose everything. It looks like we we were building a house of cards, and all of a sudden, by a, a, a blow of a wind or something, it just collapsed. Everything has collapsed, and it's so too much to you know handle and 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 uh, uh, digest. But uh, Unfortunately, I see that many of my colleagues who are who have left who are left behind in, in Kabul and other provinces uh, in different media outlets, they are under tremendous pressure. They uh, they are facing threats by the Taliban. They are facing torture by the Taliban. They uh, you know they are receiving orders from the Taliban that you should, um, you know, uh, broadcast this report and avoid touching that kind of stories. So, so that, that's the situation now in Kabul. We, uh, my, my family, about my family, some members of the family are still in Kabul and uh, uh, we are worried about them, but let's see what future brings. Okay, thank you. And I, I know all of us, hope for the best for your family, for the country. Um, I, think, I think what we can maybe hear in some of the questions is what, what, what is the future? How can, what role can places like the Shorenstein Center play? What role can places like Ground Truth, my organization play in trying to support what I think is the cornerstone of any civil, any society that's going to have any kind of civic participation is gonna need a free press. That, that is a belief, I think, of many of the people on this call. I know you believe it, I believe it, and I wanna get at that. Um, there's an excellent question already, but just while we're getting to this first question, please, if you do have a question, please bring them forward and know that um, you can read Sammy's full paper. There's a link in the chat um, and you'll see uh, it, is, it is extensive. It is written before the crisis. So I think, I think Sammy, one of the challenges for you is gonna be bringing your research forward and helping us understand the landscape where it is right now, as I believe it's more than 150 newsrooms have closed just since the US troop pull out. Um, that number is changing every day. So you may be able to update us on that. But where it, where it was when you did this report was about, a, if I'm correct, $150 million investment by the United States alone in um, media development um, over the 20 years. And it did yield some successes and maybe just hit the high notes on that landscape, um, what kind of growth you saw in a free press in Afghanistan and what role did it play in, in the country during the last 20 years? Uh, well, from having no media uh, to, I mean, becoming one of the, the most vibrant media industry in the region is a very long trip. It's a very long journey but um, we made it just in two decades, um, 20 years. Uh, I think it, it was long, but at the same time, it was short. We, we have lost uh, more than 100 journalists during these 20 years to, um, you know, explosions to suicide attacks and also targeted killings of uh, um, uh, journalists and media reporters by the Taliban, by Daesh, by Al-Qaeda, and many other um, uh, terrorist organizations across the country. Media 
became, you know, the liberators of Afghan people in the past 20 years. They provided platforms for all sectors of the society. Uh, a society which was ruled by the Taliban, before the Taliban ruled by Mujahideen groups, and before that by communists, supported by then um, Soviet Union. Um, so we didn't have this experience of um, free press in Afghanistan. Of course, the, you know, the struggle for having a free media and free press in Afghanistan started like a hundred years ago. Uh, when we got our independence from the, uh, the Great uh, Britain. But every time we had a free press, then the, the government, the state, would you know, push it back uh, by enforcing uh, very um, strict laws. This time, we had the support of international community. The, our, our own society wanted it. And uh, it became the torch of liberty for, for our society. We didn't have a strong political parties to, you know, as like political opposition for, uh, for the government. We didn't have strong institutions in Afghanistan. We didn't have a strong parliament. We didn't have a strong uh, civil society. So media was kind of playing all these roles. And uh, by providing platforms to all people and all sorts of um, voices from all backgrounds. Um, I think when we say media is one of our most important achievements, we see that by flee of our former president, Ashraf Ghani, from Afghanistan, the day he fled, our national army collapsed. Our national police collapsed, our security and intelligent, uh, intelligence collapsed, our government collapsed, our parliament collapsed, but the only thing which remained was media. And media is still standing tall, even after being tortured by the Taliban. That's why we can say this is really a, a very big achievement for, for our society. And the second achievement is. Uh, women education. You see the first groups uh, all around the country who stood against the Taliban for their rights uh, are women. All across the country in Kabul, Herat, Mazar and Nangarhar and many different parts of the country, women were the first and these are the women who had a chance to go to schools and educate themselves in the past 20 years by the help of international community and the United States um, taxpayers, of course. So, so that's that's the um, um, kind of role media played in Afghanistan in the past twenty years. The Taliban has really shown how it's going to treat uh, a, a free press in Afghanistan right out of the gate. Despite the press conference they held in the first days when they when they took power, um, remember that press conference where they said they will they will have a free media, they will allow women and girls to be educated uh, within the framework of Islam, leaving all of us to ponder what they meant by that. But the pictures, the photographs that have emerged of journalists being beaten for covering the first protests of women against the Taliban are right away evidence of, of, of where it seems they're headed. But is, is that your sense that the Taliban is, is going to be the same old Taliban we knew. And also a great question, one of the first questions that came in was about the Taliban's use of public relations. They hold a press conference where they put a message out, it doesn't seem to have any bearing on reality, but they put their own spin on it. Um, and, and one of the first questions was how how has the media succeeded in this? Who's training the media in public relations? And so maybe both those questions, what is the Taliban's stance now in relation to the media from your perspective and to the, to the question, who's, who's, who's coaching them on public relations? Well, um, um, about the second question, I think they have got some good trainers in our neighboring country. And, uh, to be clear, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, Pakistan, that's uh, 
that's not uh, something right. hidden. Right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, they are they are using PR very um, intelligently. Uh, um, I mean, they have had a very clear message uh, to Afghan population, and they have pursued that message um, all the time, very strictly, that they are fighting a foreign occupation, that they are fighting infidels, they are fighting the spies of infidels, such kind of uh, a narrative. And uh, I don't know who has been training them uh, Exactly, but we know that it's in our neighboring country, um, the same place that they, are, they have been trained for, unfortunately, for terrorist uh, activities as well. And they have received support from there, and it's, it's, uh, everybody knows that. Um, and about the uh, first question, Taliban's relations with media now, and their standpoint, I think it's visible in the scars uh, on the faces of our journalists. That's the kind of relationship Taliban uh, are looking uh, for with media. It means you, you will accept whatever uh, Taliban give you as a story, or you will be beaten up, or maybe killed, or expelled from the country. We are expelled from the country. We didn't choose to leave the country. Right. We are expelled. We had no other choice. Otherwise, many of us would be killed or tortured or forced to report um, under uh, the watch of the Taliban and under, um, you know, their supervision. I hear from my colleagues that Taliban are giving orders to newsrooms. For example, Taliban's government is still not recognized by any country in the world. And they came to power by force, using force. Now they call themselves the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Those media outlets who are um, hesitant to uh, use these terms are under tremendous pressure. And some of them are forced to use um, Islamic Emirate of the Taliban as the official title for, for the Taliban. Some others are still um, uh, titling them as the Taliban government, Taliban minister of culture. But this is not acceptable uh, uh, to the Taliban. So um, the only relationship that Taliban want from media is to become their mouthpiece and their puppets. Otherwise, there is no place for media. Another example is that, you know, a person, the Taliban appointed a new chancellor for Kabul University, country's uh, largest and most prominent uh, uh, university, uh, historic university. This new chancellor, um, who has no academic background, uh, he used to, you know, um, advocate for killing journalists. He has tweeted that uh, killing a journalist is equal, even more important, to killing like more than 100 uh, local police. So, and he says that anybody who restrains from killing journalists, he doubts that guy's uh, faith in Islam. Such a, you know, um, advocate of terrorism and killing of jour journalists now has become the uh, head of Afghanistan's largest university. A university so, where I, I believe you you were you served as a professor at one point, right? Yes. Yeah. And you know, it's it's knowing that in in the cabinet there are also two, I believe it's two members of the Haqqani family and the Haqqani network. Uh, which has also been in the business of, of kidnapping uh, journalists and suppressing a free press. And I know that there are friends and dear colleagues who suffered uh, from the Haqqani network, um, Afghan and 
American and other countries who, who, who the Connie Network targeted the media. And they're now in the government. It's, it, it is an extraordinary moment. There's a great question here for you, Sammy, from a co-fellow, co-Shorenstein fellow. Um, Franz Kruger is asking, um, you know, could you speak to, to the extraordinary achievement, of course, of, of women's education, but also women in media? You know, I've had the great opportunity to get to know some extraordinary uh, women journalists in Afghanistan, and so many of them were already going into hiding when I was there in the end of July. Now, most of them are, are really in a perilous point. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, what, what challenges are uniquely faced by women in journalism in Afghanistan? What is the situation on the ground there right now for women journalists? <clears throat> That's a, a great and a very important uh, question. Um, actually, some of our best journalists are women. Most courageous uh, journalists in Afghanistan are women. I can give you some names. Anisa Shaheed is a champion. He, she, she was my uh, colleague at, at uh, Tolo News. She is a champion for everyone. Hasiba Atakpal is another champion. Shakila Ibrahim Khil is another champion. I mean, I have learned from them. I, they were my colleagues and I, I used to learn every day something from them. From the courage, from their professional um, um, reporting. And uh, uh, there, there are some, there are very unique personalities that we have. Uh, we have dozens of such reporters and media uh, workers in Afghanistan, all female. And uh, unfortunately, they were the first ones to be targeted. We remember uh, that at least three female journalists were killed in one day in the eastern province of Nangarhar. They were all working for one TV station, a local TV station. And the responsibility was taken by, by Daesh, but we are really not sure. So, um, you know, women who choose to become journalists, TV journalists, especially in Afghanistan, they were very courageous because in our traditional um, society, it, it was kind of taboo to become TV presenter or TV journalist for women. But they were courageous enough to choose this path. And then face all these challenges that any other journalist in, in the country was facing, the threats, the insecurity, and, and everything. Uh, you know, when Taliban came to power, one of the first things they did was to take off um, all um, female reporters and presenters of RTA, our uh, state-owned uh, TV channel. So this discouraged all other uh, female presenters and reporters all across the country because they knew that Taliban, uh, who are not respecting any laws, uh, are in control and their lives are, you know, at risk. And what of the three journalists you mentioned at the beginning, or or what is known of their fate now? Um, if you if you know, I. I'd... I'd like to know sort of how those of us who want to follow their work can continue to do so. Um, where are they now? Well, um, I think uh, Anisa, is, Anisa is outside Afghanistan, Anisa Shahid. Uh, Hasiba Atakbal, Atakbal is also outside Afghanistan, but I'm not sure if they're working. Uh, I think they have lost their jobs and uh, they have become refugees, you know, somewhere. Uh, with, you know, unknown future, unknown fate. Um, Shakila Ibrahim Khil, which was uh, a bit senior, um, I mean, he left Afghanistan earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but most of female journalists are still in Kabul and around the country. Right. I receive, I receive uh, messages and emails every day from my former colleagues. They're asking for support and for a way to get out of the country. I'd like to try to follow their work. Maybe if you get a chance um, with this group, you could share some links to how we might we might be able to to 
be part of following that. It sort of leads into another question here about what role the international community can play in supporting uh, resistance to this government and um, whether the United States should recognize the Taliban officially. This was a big question right this week at the UN General Assembly as the Taliban was pushing for recognition. Um, just curious, your, your views on that. What role can the international community play? And I think because of this audience around the Shorenstein Center, what role can the international community play in supporting a free press in Afghanistan in this time of transition and tremendous challenge to all those gains that were made in the last 20 years? There are a number of uh, policy actions that international community, United States in, in particular, and international institutions and NGOs could, could uh, take. First and foremost, do not recognize uh, Taliban regime. Uh, that's the last leverage that international community has got over uh, Taliban. You mentioned that at least two members of the cabinet are from the Haqqani network, but 17 members of the cabinet are on the blacklist. The UN Security Council's blacklist because of their affiliation with the terrorist activities and they are, they are uh, known terrorists. So if international community chooses to recognize such a government, it will be for the first time in, in modern history to recognize a terrorist government. The majority of the cabinet members are on the blacklist of UN Security Council. That's the first thing. The second thing, you know, international humanitarian assistance uh, is very important. Uh, for the Taliban government, and they are very much seeking for it. Sammy, your your video just froze from my point of view, which might mean it's a good time. Yeah, maybe switch to to just audio. We we really like to hear uh, your answers. Can you hear me now? Sammy, are you able to hear me now? I'm going to I'm going to um, hope that you come back in and in the meantime there's a question here from Richard Parker that uh, who I who I just want to say hello to and who um, really introduced me first to this to this research paper and this incredibly important work um, and Richard's asking about sort of a question I know we're all wondering like how can western governments think about terms for offering ongoing aid basic humanitarian assistance, food, medicine, but also support for Afghan media, both in the country and outside. It's, it's a really great question. So I'm, I'm gonna hope that we have you back uh, now. Sammy, are you able to hear me? And did you hear the question? If not, I can repeat it. All right, this is- um, Can you hear me? Oh yes, we can now, great, there you are, I can. Um, please, please go ahead. Did you hear the question, Sammy? Would you like me to repeat it? Mm. Uh, yeah, there you are. You want to give it a shot, see if we hold signal? Sammy, I'm going to make the executive decision here, and maybe unless I get instruction in the chat otherwise maybe you could try dialing back in if there's if that's a bad idea could you answer answer in the chat what you think is the best uh best proposal here to try to bring sammy in yeah great okay they, they lindsay is saying the same so lindsay when you get um when you get sammy back in just please bring him in and in the meantime I would, I would just say there's another question here coming from Hannah Tamiz, which is an excellent question from the Neiman Lab about um, getting to know uh, the digital innovation that's happening in Afghanistan's media in terms of reaching new audiences and meeting information needs. Uh, I'm going to take a chance at trying to answer a little bit of that, but Richard, I think your question about Western governments and aid is, has to go to Sammy. But if I could, Anna, I would say I was just in Afghanistan. I was really in the newsrooms. And one of the things that impressed me was the ways they are using social media. And there's a lot of cross-platform work. Um, Tolo especially has had pretty sophisticated outreach in terms of push 
and in terms of audience growth um, and how they're going after it. And other news organizations, even some of the leading um, text news organizations or print news organizations are almost all much bigger audiences online and digital. And being online, I was able to, to follow them and I have been following them, but they also do extraordinary local reporting, which I think is the key here. They have reporters who are out in the provinces and they were reporting in. And I was in one newsroom, 8 a.m. daily, which is a very good news organization that has emerged, that has, has a sophisticated presence uh, and a digital footprint. And, and uh, Sammy, I think you're back with us now, yes? Yeah, I'm back. I'm hey, sorry uh, for I'll finish this sentence and then I wanna get right to Richard Parker's question, which is building upon the last one. But Hannah, we can come back to this. But I would just say at 8 a.m. daily, I was in the newsroom on the day when they were getting calls coming in from the provincial reporters about the Taliban taking the border crossings. There were, I think, seven different border crossings on that day in the end of July when the Taliban had, had actually taken the crossings. And it was like hearing a live newsroom buzzing with information. The only kind of information you can get from your reporters being out there in the field doing what we would call ground truth getting there on the ground, really working hard to get at the facts and, and bringing them forward. And it was a very big news day for that reason. So I think Sammy will do a much better job answering the depth of your question here, Hannah, and I promise we'll circle back to it. But I wanna phrase Richard's question again, because it builds upon what you were saying just before we lost you, Sammy. How should Western governments think about terms for offering ongoing aid, both basic humanitarian assistance like food and medicine, but also support for the Afghan media. And, and Richard makes the important distinction both in the country and outside the country. Um, how would you answer that one? Well, uh, first of all, let me thank again, uh, Professor Richard Parker, because uh, I have received so much support uh, from him as my advisor during uh, this research. Uh, without him and without his, uh, without his guidance and advice and support, I will, I would never be able to do this. So thank you so much again, uh, Richard. Um, about the question, I think the condition for any kind of recognition of Taliban government should be that um, the Taliban should recognize human rights, basic human rights, and provide uh, a space for freedom of expression, women education, women working outside their houses, and also for the minority groups. And also any kind of international support and aid should you know, be conditioned on these um, um, conditions. Sammy, why don't you- Otherwise, go, Taliban I'm will use Sammy. these uh, support. Sorry to interrupt, Sammy, but I'm going to propose maybe go off video because you're breaking up a tiny bit again. I'd, I'd like to keep you with us for as long as we can. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Can you hear right. me? Yes, go Is ahead. Better? Okay. So um, any kind of international aid uh, should also be conditioned on recognition of human rights, freedom of expression, women's uh, meaningful uh, participation in the uh, public life, uh, including being uh, represented meaningfully uh, in the government and also minorities rights. Otherwise, it will be just supporting uh, an Islamic uh, extremist, uh, extremist group who has no, um, who shows no respect for any of these uh, uh, rights. And what else the international community could do inside and outside Afghanistan for media? I think continuing their presence and support for media is very, very important. I know dozens of journalists uh, from Afghanistan who are outside the country now, but they are trying to build up new platforms because those um, media outlets who are still in the country um, are kind of collapsing now or becoming mouthpieces of, of the Taliban because they are forced to do so. So having a platform outside the country is very important now. 
uh, they will be, you know, connected to journalists on the ground, as you said, to tell the truth on the ground. But those journalists who are on the ground will not be able to publish their stories under their own names and in um, um, the those uh, uh, outlets who are still in Afghanistan. So a collaboration between those uh, journalists who were able to get out of the country and those who are still on the ground, very, very important because now we do not have one or doing to document all the atrocities against human rights and violations of human rights across the country under the Taliban watch. And also, there is no way that the international community could, uh, how the aid is uh, being spent um, under the areas controlled by the Taliban. If we just look at the, what we have from the past few weeks, the, you know, the amount of footage, documents, and video got out of the country while Taliban were torturing uh, women and journalists across the country is way more than what we have from the five years of it's because now we have the presence of media there. So this presence should be supported by international community by providing support for media, for um, uh, journalists who want to build uh, new platforms who are in the uh, in outside Afghanistan. Sami, you talked about making aid conditional on the delivery of human rights, women's rights, especially, and also rights to a free press and freedom of expression. And the aid connection is a, is a solid one and one that I think can, we can hopefully uh, be effective around and, and those who care about those rights will, will support it. But is there something more practical? You know, you have the UN General Assembly right in New York now, if you were speaking directly to them, is there a need for something more, um, more forceful uh, than just contingencies on aid, um, which could, could in, a, in a strange way hurt people if we're not sending in food and medical aid that may not get at the the regime as much and uh, we've struggled with that with sanctions all over the world but I'm wondering what other mechanisms what other levers what kind of UN resolution what kind of action could the international community take collectively what kind of action could the United States try to take uh, and other countries to to create more leverage on the government itself of the Taliban well um, the Taliban government doesn't have any money now to run the government. So they are looking for uh, to receive money from outside. It could be China, it could be Pakistan or some Gulf countries. So besides uh, sanctioning Taliban themselves uh, for their terrorist activities and keeping those sanctions and not uh, upholding any, any and or delisting Taliban, uh, I think the United States and international community could pressure those who are supporting the Taliban in the region. Okay, thank That's you. very important. And yeah. also, while international community is thinking about sending humanitarian aid for the sake of humanitarian uh, reasons, it shouldn't be spent by the Taliban government. It should be directly spent by international NGOs. Otherwise, right. Taliban could use it. And the expenditure of uh, these aid monies should be monitored by um, uh, Afghan media. And uh, th uh, that's how Afghan media could become a partner of international community once again. Okay, um, a good follow-up question from Franz here about um, with so many journalists in exile, do you see an important role for the media produced for the country from the diaspora. You mentioned this a little bit, but I'm, I'm really interested in this too, and I'm sure I'm not alone. If there are any initiatives underway now, how can we all get involved in this? What is a role we could all play in supporting um, the Afghan media in the diaspora? And then hopefully 
through the internet that that could serve the country in Afghanistan as well. One of the suggestions I have in this paper is uh, that uh, Afghan media should uh, think to become more digital and online. That's uh, more feasible, uh, cheaper, and uh, um, it's more doable, especially when they are outside the country. Uh, so I'm hearing from my colleagues that uh, they want to create new platforms, new media outside the country. So I would say international community could support nonprofit organizations created and built by, by um, um, Afghan journalists who have become now diaspora. They are willing to do so. They have the talent. They have uh, the connections still inside the country and they have the expertise. So the only thing missing is some fund and support uh, from international community. Uh, we could build up these uh, uh, new platforms, non, uh, non-profit organizations, very quickly. Oh, great. And, you know, um, I think you know this, Sammy, but Ground Truth is, is, is eager to be in on that effort, and we'll stay in touch on that. And a, another related question came uh, just before we lost you from Hannah Tamiz from the Neiman Lab going right at what you were just saying about, about digital innovation in Afghanistan. Maybe give us a sense of how those organizations on the ground, even though they're really struggling right now, or those that could be created in the diaspora, what are you seeing that's exciting in digital innovation in Afghanistan's media, particularly in terms of reaching new audiences and meeting the information needs of those audiences? Well, currently there are about 15 million um, internet users in Afghanistan. So that's kind of half of the population. So uh, recent uh, studies show that uh, most of uh, the population receive uh, their uh, daily news from social media. And social media is becoming um, a very uh, powerful and important uh, tool for information. So that's already taking place and uh, we have millions of uh, social media users in Afghanistan on you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and uh, many other. So um, it will be very easy for those journalists and media executives who are outside the country now to reach the population through social media. Uh, as far as uh, internet is still available in Afghanistan under the Taliban. Sadly, the Taliban is also getting more and more sophisticated in social media and in and the push of its own point of view. And one of the things I, I really care about, and I know you do, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on is keeping the presence of local reporters on the ground there. You know, I, I fear a world in which it's so digital and it's so from afar that people are just filing um, anonymously and from from their homes and their basements without without the the eyes out there really documenting and seeing what's happening and then sharing that with an audience that needs to know particularly in the places that are hard to see in afghanistan to get into the undercovered corners of that country where do you see that happening now if it is and how can we support that effort well um, you know since the taliban took over kabul we see uh, that media is not critically reporting on the Taliban. Uh, it's because of the fear out there and the sense of terror in the city. And uh, also because the resources, the, the, the sources of information is limiting day by day. Mm -hmm. So Taliban, for example, an explosion happens uh, in the past, the Ministry of uh, Public Health would give out numbers and data about uh, the, you know, those who were killed or wounded in the attack. Now, the Taliban refrain to do anything like that. They, they, they do not give out 
uh, numbers, they do not give out, out information. So that's a restriction already imposed on the, on the uh, reporters. But at the same time, because we have many experienced and skilled reporters on the ground, um, they know how to uh, you know, uh, find their way to get access to information which is not, uh, I mean, uh, uh, unitarily um, um, obtained by the Taliban. So they, they will find their own sources of, of information. It's challenging. It will be very difficult to do, but I think there is talent to do it. Okay. And we only have a, about three minutes left, and I think I've gotten all of the questions that were in the Q&A. Um, if there's one I missed, um, you know, maybe resend that one. So I'm sure that we try to get everyone's questions in. And we are going to try to end right on time because it's a, it's a busy time for everyone to get back into uh, the fall and all, you know, trying to stay on schedule. But I, I want to ask a little bit deeper question about the reporting on the ground. And, and I'm just curious if there isn't reporting that can be done that would so serve the community that it would outflank the Taliban's attempts to restrict it. And what I mean by that is, you know, reporting on things like um, the condition of the roads. The, the ring road is incredibly dangerous and flawed and, and ill-conceived and it was a fiasco. Energy, what's happening in the energy sector and who's getting the energy and who isn't and what's happened with, for example, the turbines at Kajiki Dam and, you know, to really look at these issues that are not political. Uh, at least not, you know, sort of inherently or easily defined on, in political terms. Is there some ground truth, some basic local reporting around the issues of health, energy, transportation, that maybe there's a way to, to deepen and make them more robust in service to the country and outflank the Taliban by having them exist outside of some of the parameters of the culture wars, if I could call it that, that are at play within Afghanistan? Well, um, I think uh, media has started reporting more on these issues, um, like the roads, uh, health, economy, education. But, um, and I see even more reports day by day uh, by um, channels like Tolo News, which was highly uh, focused on political and security reports in the past. Um, we see more reports on, on these issues. Um, but at the same time, any report which, which criticizes the current regime there in, in Kabul is, uh, you know, uh, perceived as, a, as a, a, an attempt to make the Taliban government look uh, weak or not able to provide uh, services. For example, what happened in the Kabul airport uh, before the American uh, forces uh, withdrawal, um, you know, nobody was in media, nobody was criticizing the Taliban for not having the capacity and the skills to run a, an airport. Nobody was talking about that. Because it was an attempt, if someone you know, would try to do that, it would be an attempt to uh, make the Taliban government look weak, and that will have consequences for journalists. So we, we are walking on a very uh, dangerous path now. It's yeah. very, very dangerous. We don't know when the Taliban will be uh, um, angry on us, upset with, uh, by one of our reports, and will come back. And it is also true that our reporters and journalists in Afghanistan have an attitude of being very bold and critical thinkers and, uh, you know, always try to keep um, those in power accountable. So that is the, our, you know, um, attitude from the past government. And now everything has changed and this change um, you know, when it will translate into the in, in change of behavior in, among uh, journalists and, and media reporters, I think that will be taking time and that will be drastic. Thank you, Sammy. We are 
We are at time. What, a, what an extraordinary privilege to hear your thinking on this. Thank you for the research paper. Thanks to the Shorenstein Center for this, for this forum. Um, you know, the crisis in local news, we feel it right here in America. And again, it's a crisis that's a global crisis. And, and I really wanna keep this dialogue going. I hope we have a chance soon to connect again, Sammy. Um, and I'll just close out by saying, I wish you and your family all the best and thinking about really everyone from Afghanistan who is part of this diaspora now and struggling with a lot of uncertainty. Thanks for being with us, Sammy. Thank you so much, Charles, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, the Assurance Center, the Ground Truth, and everybody who you know helped us to uh, do this. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be a fellow at the Assurance Center. Thank you. And again, the link to Sammy's paper is here in the chat, uh, and and uh, it's very important work. Thank you, Sammy. Thank Thanks you. Everybody.